So guys, now let us try to understand how timer works. That is how operating system implements the concept of timers. So timer works in the context of separate code flow which could be a separate thread or a separate process altogether. So let us try to understand this with the help of this below diagram. Suppose you have written some application P which is running on your machine. In this application you have some function foo which accepts some argument, right? And this function do some piece of work. Main represents your actual application which is running and executing its logic, right? Suppose at some point of time here your application launches a new timer, right? So let us suppose that new timer launch is some hypothetical API which your application uses in order to start a new timer, right? Now note that your application starts a timer because your application wants to do some unit of work when the timer expires, right? That unit of work which is done as a result of timer expiration is represented by this function foo, right? So whenever we create a timer, one of the mandatory argument that we need to pass is the function pointer. This function pointer represents a function which will be executed when your timer expires, right? And it is obvious that if you are invoking the function, then you need to pass some argument to this function. So for each timer, you have to pass at least two things. The first is the unit of work which the timer will execute when it fires. That unit of work is represented by this function foo and the second argument is the argument which will be passed as an argument to this function foo, right? So as soon as this API is invoked, your process P would continue to execute the subsequent lines of code whereas your operating system will fork out a new thread at this line of code right and it will create a separate code flow in the form of a new thread t1 right so this block represents a new thread t1 altogether which is created by the parent process p now let us suppose that this API created a thread with expiration time equal to 5 seconds. So as soon as the process P had forked out this thread, right, in order to create a timer, this thread will not execute and it will stay blocked, right? The operating system will keep this thread in the blocked state, whereas your process P can execute whatever it wants after the API new timer launched has returned. This is how thread forking works, right? Your parent process continues its execution flow. Now, since the expiration time of this timer was set to 5 seconds, it means that after only 5 seconds has elapsed, the operating system will then invoke a function foo with the argument arg which was specified here, right? Now function foo can execute whatever logic it had. So you can see this is how timer works. The function foo represents the unit of work which we need to do when the timer fires, right? So the function foo will be triggered only after 5 seconds has elapsed after the API new timer launch was invoked. So when foo has completed its execution in the context of the timer thread, timer is turned off. When I say that the timer is turned off, it means that the timer thread is killed by the kernel or operating system. So as soon as this function completes its execution and returns, the timer thread T1 is automatically killed by the kernel or operating system because the unit of work which was supposed to be done by the timer has completed. Application P, that is the process P, should free all the resources that were occupied by timer in the end of foo function only, right? Now it might be possible that in order to prepare this argument, your application must have malloced certain data structures, right? And those data structures were passed as an argument to this timer function foo, right? So it is your responsibility to free these data structures at the end of this foo function, right? 
Just before the timer function has completed its work, it should free all the resources. Don't worry, we were going to implement all this logic and I will show you with the help of an example how to do that. So the function foo in technical term is called a timer callback. The mechanics that we discussed here regarding how timers are implemented by the operating system applies to all types of timer that is one shot timer, periodic timer or exponential back of timer. In case of one shot timer, once the function foo completes its execution, the kernel or operating system kills the thread t1, right? Whereas in case of periodic timer, once the function foo completes its execution, the operating system puts the thread t1 in the blocked state again, right? And after again 5 seconds has elapsed, then again the function foo is called. And this cycle repeats for forever. And in case of exponential back of timer, once the function foo has completed its execution, the operating system again put the timer thread t1 in the blocked state, right? But instead of now waiting for 5 seconds, we will wait for 10 seconds, right? And only after 10 seconds has elapsed, then only the timer callback is invoked. Again, when the timer callback finishes its execution, the operating system will put the timer t1 in the blocked state again. And this time, it will wait for time t is equal to 20 seconds, right? So every time the waiting timer will be doubled of the previous wait time. So you can see that the fundamentals for implementing one shot periodic and exponential back of timer are no different.